Good morning. This is Frinton Gospel Chapel and it's our online service. We welcome you this morning. We welcome those that are regular members and welcome those that joined us for the very first time. We welcome if church services are not your kind of thing or whoever you are or wherever you are, may you find encouragement and help and reassurance in whatever circumstances you find yourself today. We are pleased you've joined us. We trust that the family bubble service at the Frinton Gospel Chapel is a blessing to all who attend this morning. Now let's pray before we go out to um, praise and worship our Father. Let's pray. Dear Father, quieten our minds, still our hearts, for your living ways are all we're seeking. Strengthen our lives and inspire our spirits. In your living water flow endless grace. Amen. And we'll go and join the band for praise and worship.
Hello, everybody. Let's uh, take some time to just lift our prayers to the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the gift of prayer. Thank you that we can say, along with the psalmist, Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, Come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. It is such a privilege, Lord, to be able to speak to you. And we just thank you that, that you are there listening at all times, Lord. You long to be in relationship with us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the prayers that you have answered. Thank you for the blessings that you have poured out. Thank you that your storehouse of blessings never runs out. That you are a, an abundant God. You are an amazing God. You are a powerful God. You are our Father. You are our King, and we just worship you. As we lift our prayers to you now, we just ask that you would encourage us, that you would keep us strong. Even though we couldn't meet as planned uh, at virtual this weekend, Lord, you are with us. And we will meet again, Lord. We will be able to come together to worship you, to pray to you, Lord, and just have fellowship. And we look forward to that time. Please continue to guide our leaders Grant them great wisdom as to how and when that may be happening. And we just uh, do just continue to put our faith in you. Lord, we uh, just acknowledge that uh, we have failed you at times. Lord, we have not followed the right way. We have put our trust in other things, Lord. And we just ask for forgiveness now. Thank you that through the sacrifice of your son, we can come before your throne. And your, your grace and your mercy... It's just poured out on us, Lord. Our sins are removed. They are forgotten. We are made clean. And we ask now that we would just be vessels for you, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would enable us to live a life that just points to the glory of God and uh, just shows others what a merciful, wonderful, saving Father we have. We ask, Lord, for your continued healing powers to be poured out to those that are struggling, Lord, with ill health. We pray for Monica and Anne especially, and all others, Lord, that have ongoing health challenges. Thank you for the healing that you already uh, poured out in their lives, and we continue to pray to do that until full health is, uh, is found again. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you long to be close to us. You draw us near, Lord, and do you uh, just welcome us into your family. It's amazing that you call us sons and daughters, and we just uh, we just revel in that, Lord. We long to be close to you. As the psalmist says, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. Help us to continue to trust in you, Lord. Help us to walk the path that you have laid out for us. And just fill our lives with the Spirit, Lord. Pour out the Spirit and uh, enable us with gifts to uh, just, to, just to live the life that you want us to live. As it says at the end of that psalm, Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. And Lord, we know we do not wait in vain. Because you are a great, great God. You have heard our prayers and you are answering them even now. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome to communion. I love the word communion because... If you break it down into its syllables, it's like a request from Jesus. Come, you and I, one. We are called by the Lord Jesus to be one with him and one with each other. I'd like just to read, if I may, from John chapter 17. Wonderful prayer of Jesus before he goes to the cross. First of all, he prays for himself and then for his disciples. And then he prays for all believers, that's us. 
My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am <clears throat> and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Wonderful, wonderful prayer. So, Father, as we come to the table, I just echo that prayer of Jesus, that as we take this simple meal, we will be one with each other and one with the Lord Jesus. Just like to read the words of St Paul from Corinthians and as we prepare. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, <clears throat> which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man, or a person rather, should ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And perhaps just a moment to examine ourselves before the Lord and just clear up anything that needs sorting out. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So now we just come to the time of communion. We'll just read those familiar words from the Gospel of Luke. Bear with me. This is Jesus. And he took the bread and gave thanks and gave it to them and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for that amazing act of grace on the cross. We are told that it is by grace that we have been saved, not through works, so none can boast. You paid a terrible price so that we could go free, but we thank you so very, very much. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and your love and your sacrifice. 
in your name we pray. Amen. Hi, uh, good morning and greetings from Ecuador. Um, years ago, Anna and myself went to a, a pantomime in Winchester. A friend of ours was uh, playing and he was a baddie. His, his um, character was called King Rat and every time he came onto the stage, he, we would, you know, boo and hiss and really got into it, even though we were grown, sensible adults. Um, but we entered the narrative and uh, it's reminded uh, reminds me a bit of uh, Acts, uh, because uh, Acts 1 verse 8 says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Years ago when I lived in Acton, there was a group near us, uh, a rap group, a Christian group, and they were called Acts 29. And I thought that was, that's a great, uh, a great name because actually Acts doesn't stop in chapter 28. It's an ongoing story. We, we look back to be inspired to go forward. We learn and study, not uh, so that we become uh, well up or experts on the book of Acts or any other book that we happen to be studying in the Bible, but that by God's grace, he might inspire us, uh, mould us, shape us, equip us for the task at hand and ahead. We uh, today are going to look at chapter 11. And um, just do you remember... Obviously, chapter 11 follows chapter 10. That's pretty deep thought there. But uh, Peter is, a, just to recap, he's obedient, isn't he, to God's uh, vision. And he goes to the house of Cornelius. He speaks and uh, people listen and they be believe and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they're baptised. And great, there's all, all smiles, you know, the, um, there's blue skies in Joppa and Peter returns to Jerusalem with a spring in his step. But those blue skies, they, they kind of turn to grey because as he gets back, uh, instead of being encouraged, he meets with opposition from, of all places, a group of believers. Uh, they're critical of him for entering to this uh, Gentile house. He, uh, Peter had broken all the religious rules and taboos of the day. And isn't that just the way? Sometimes we we doing things that we feel are for the kingdom of God, something positive, and yet there are those who are ready to... Uh, bring us down to earth or to take pot shots at us. How does Peter respond to this criticism? Interesting, isn't it? You know, Peter, the one who was willing to walk on water, uh, willing to jump out of the boat and, uh, you know, the one who sometimes spoke uh, before he thought, the one who, if you got in his way, would draw a sword and cut off your ear. But in the title of the NIV, we get this. Uh, it says, Peter explains his actions that's uh, an interesting title, isn't it? He could have appealed to his position or title. Hey, hey, guys, I'm, I'm leader of the church. Uh, I was, you know, Jesus called me Rock or Rocky. Um, he gave me the keys of the kingdom. He could have appealed to his past experiences, you know, being on the Mount of Transfiguration and being involved in miracles. He could have just relied on his personality type and pushed everyone down and say, I don't have to bother with you. But no, he's, he's patient and he explains his actions. And because of that, we read in verse 18, when they heard uh, this, they had no further objections and they praised God saying, so then, even the Gentiles has granted, uh, God has granted repentance that leads to life. It wasn't just what Peter said, but how he said it that kind of calmed the situation down. Unfortunately, this, this situation wasn't going to go away. And uh, this problem with this group, what was we know as the what was called the circumcision group and it reappears in Acts 15. And even Peter was in a, a learning process. He had a setback in uh, Antioch um, despite this, the, the vision that he had uh, and uh, this divine vision. Um, he has a bad lapse in Antioch because when um, he's, he's, he's there, he's eating with the Gentile believers and then a group from Jerusalem arrive who are uh, kind of Jewish believers and he uh, sets aside the Gentile believers and uh, shies away from them. And Paul has to kind of call a spade a spade and uh, uh, really uh, approach Peter f in public face to face and say, Peter, you're not acting in line with the gospel. And uh, so even Peter was in a, a learning process. This uh, sin of uh, discrimination keeps 
raising its head. Uh, John, John Stott says that uh, the, uh, the same ugly sin of discrimination has kept reappearing in the church in the form of racism, colour prejudice, nationalism, my country, right or wrong, tribalism in Africa, the caste system in India, social and cultural snobbery in other societies, sexism, discriminating against women. In all such discrimination, all, sorry, all such discrimination is inexcusable, even in non-Christian society. In the Christian community, it is both an obscenity because it's offensive to human dignity and a blasphemy because it's offensive um, to God. who accepts without discrimination all who repent and believe. Like Peter, we need too to learn that God does not show favoritism. Let's go on to verse uh, 19. Now those who have been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed travelled as far as Phoenicia, that's kind of modern day Lebanon, and Cyprus and Antioch, uh, that's in Syria, uh, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So the the mission, uh, if you like, spread geographically, uh, but more importantly, it spread not only crossing physical boundaries, but cultural boundaries and ideological boundaries as well. And and isn't that the the kind of challenge that we face today in in the church? It's not just a question of crossing lands, but the, the whole way uh, that the different ideologies and the philosophies that, that, and the way that people think. Charles Colson in his book, How Now Shall We Live, said this, the world is divided not so much by geographic boundaries, but by religious and cultural traditions, by people's most deeply held beliefs, beliefs by what we call worldviews. So argued the distinguished Harvard scholar Samuel Huntingdon in a celebrated article a number of years ago. And Christians would agree, because we are religious creatures, our lives are defined by our ultimate beliefs more sharply than by any other factor. The drama of history is played out along the frontiers of great belief systems as they ebb and flow. But if this is so, what does it tell us about the divisions in the world today? Where is the clash of civilizations most bitter? Huntingdon predicted a clash between the worldview of three major traditional civilizations, the Western world, the Islamic world, and the Confucian East. But one of his former students, political scientist James Couth, uh, took issue with him, contending that the most significant clash would be within Western civilization itself, between those who adhere to a Judeo-Christian framework and those who favor postmodernism. As Colson goes on to say, we... Christians are aliens in our own land, worldview missionaries to our own post-Christian, post-modernist culture. When we look at verse uh, 19 and 20 of the, and underline that there's some of them, however, these men, they, they took a risk. They not only um, spoke to their Jewish compatriots, but they began to speak to Greeks, to non-Jews, Uh, also telling them the good news of the Lord Jesus. Luke, who who wrote Acts, uh, focuses obviously mainly on Peter at first and then Paul, these kind of pillars of the church. But here he mentions these unknown heroes who take a risk, who are willing to break the mold, are willing to go against the idea of the circumcision group, who begin to speak not just to one or two, like, uh, like Peter and Cornelius, but groups, to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. Um... Nicky Gumbel in his uh, a book on Philippians talks about a group called the Gamblers. In the days of the early church, he says, there was an association of men and women who were called the Gamblers. Their aim was to visit prisons and those sick with dangerous and infectious diseases. Uh, they were willing to hazard their lives for Jesus and for others. And in many ways, you could say that these men here in verse 19 and 20, they could be called the Gamblers or the Risk Takers. They were willing to step out, if you like, of the comfort zone. Uh, And um, you can imagine them praying the prayer of Psalm 90, verse 17, establish the work of our hands, God, establish the work of our hands. We read in verse 21 of chapter 11, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And so started this embryonic early, uh, this church in Antioch. 
and uh, by a group of people who we don't even know their names. As someone once said, it's amazing what can get done when no one is worried about who gets the credit. Let's just think a little bit about this uh, city of Antioch. It was the third most uh, important uh, city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. Um, we often hear, didn't we, uh, don't we, that, that all roads kind of led to Rome. But in some sense, Antioch too had this reputation that um, anyone who travelled um, would at some stage pass through uh, this cosmopolitan city. It was, uh, and, and the church that formed was cosmopolitan in, in nature. It, it reminds uh, us a little bit of that um, that taster we get in Reve- uh, of, of the forerunner of what we read in Revelation chapter 7, uh, I think it is, verse 9, where it talks about that, that great multitude, uh, a people from every nation, language, tribe and tongue uh, are there before the, th- uh, the, 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 the throne of the Lamb. Yeah? And um, it's in uh, Antioch... Um, well, like I say, this, this, this church was, in one sense, as some have referred to it, as the first kind of international church. Yeah. In terms of the spread of Christianity, there seems to be a shift going on um, between the, the hub moving from Jerusalem to Antioch. Antioch becomes, if you like, the mission-sending church. You'll see that in Acts 13 uh, when uh, Paul and Barnabas go on this first mission journey. And it seems that there's this shift between uh, Jerusalem being the centre to Antioch. Um, In Antioch, you would hear many different languages, but the one most common or in general use would be, uh, and most understood, would be Greek. And the Greek name for Christ... Uh, sorry, the name uh, Messiah in Greek is, is the word Christ. And his followers became known as Christians, little Christs. Some say it was a name given uh, in um, kind of mockery, in, in ridicule. Others say it was just, uh, just a, a kind of um, a nickname. And just as there were groups you know, like called the Herodians, followers of Herod, and there was another group, uh, followers of Caesar. Um, So this, the followers of Christ became known as Christians. In uh, the opponents of John Wesley, uh, because of uh, John Wesley's methodical ways, they became known, the followers became known as Methodists, yeah? But this name, Christian, whether it was given in malice or to poke fun or just a nickname, it stuck. Christian, and we should be uh, proud, shouldn't we, in the right sense, uh, to bear that name. The Church of Jerusalem, they hear what's going on in Antioch and they know the best man to send to check out what's going on. We read this, don't we, in verse 22 onwards. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. We we could have, we could, you know, if we, um, we could have easily read perhaps about Barnabas. When he arrived in Antioch, he took control of the situation and he set down some rules and regulations and placed some boundaries And he let everyone know that he was boss. But uh, Barnabas was completely different, wasn't he? Uh, I love the character of of Barnabas. Uh, We we read about him earlier in Acts and uh, there's so much that uh, we can learn from him. He's the kind of person that you would love to have in your church or in your house group or play on your football team or, or whatever. Four E's very quickly. He was an encourager. He lived up to his name, son of encouragement. Yeah? He was always seeking to encourage and to bring out the best in people. And, and I remember someone once saying, you can never get too much encouragement. Not talking about flattery and you know, people being uh, super, super nice um, you know, with a cherry on top or anything like that. But he was a genuine encourager. Secondly, he was an example. He was his character. He was a good man. Yeah? 
Thirdly, he was eager to enhance. I, I love this. He, his, his whole view, his whole outlook was about the kingdom. He knows that the church in Antioch, they could really do with Paul to help build them up. So he goes and looks for Paul. He brings him back from Tarsus. Um, he could have easily thought, Barnabas, hey, you know, the leaders in uh, Jerusalem, uh, they sent me and it's my job, it's my role, it's my position. Uh, but Barnabas has got a large heart. He's got a, a kingdom mindset and uh, he goes and brings Paul to come and help and they work uh, together. And, and uh, the last E, endurance. He and Paul uh, stay uh, for a year building the church. Yeah, and they commit themselves to building up the church. Barnabas commits himself later on to uh, helping John Mark find his feet faith-wise and uh, seeing that he goes on, even when Paul perhaps had, had had enough. Um, Barnabas was an encourager. He was an example. He was eager to enhance and to further the kingdom of God. He endured in so many ways, yeah? And uh, just as we finish, we, we, we read about this. Uh, there's the, uh, what happens is a prophet from Jerusalem comes uh, to Antioch and uh, he predicts that there's going to be a famine in the region. And uh, as Tom Wright points out in his book, at once, what, what's the response of this church in Antioch? At once, the Christians in Antioch do not say to themselves, how shall we survive? But rather, how can we help those who will be in a worse position than ourselves? That's, that's great, isn't it? At once the Christians in Antioch do not say to themselves, how shall we survive? But rather, how can we help those who will be in a worse position than ourselves? They had learned, I think, from observing Barnabas and Paul, uh, the grace, the character, the generosity, the kindness. And they, in, they had bought into that as well. And out of that, they decide to give to uh, the church in Jerusalem that was in a, going to be in a worse situation than themselves. Just uh, want to encourage you uh, as you continue to study through Acts to remember that we're part of the ongoing narrative. Yeah, we are Acts 29, 30, 31 and so on. And, and the, the invitation's there, isn't it? To be involved in that ongoing narrative. Yeah, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. Um, we we uh, we miss you very much. We we often think and uh, pray for you, and we just trust that God will continue to bless you as a fellowship. Thank you for the way that uh, you bless and encourage and uh, pray for us here as well. And so, on behalf of Anna and myself, yeah, we just want to say uh, God bless and greetings, and uh, take care.
Thank you for joining us today. And this is the end of the service. But may the grace of God uphold you. The peace of God surround you. The love of God flow from you. And the strength of God protect and bring you safely through this day and this, this week. Amen. Amen.